As we approach the one-year anniversary of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, a look at the ground war and the front lines. Ukraine and the U.S. say Russian forces have launched offensives in three areas of Ukraine's eastern Donbass region. With support from the Pulitzer Center, Nick Schifrin and videographer Eric O'Connor visited all three parts of the front, starting at one of the most southern points on the front line, Novosilka. And a warning, some images in this story are disturbing. The road to Ukraine's first tank brigade frontline position is bumpy and tense. We're escorted by a sergeant who tells us to stay low and move fast. Hey, let's go. Trees provide the best cover. Our guide calls ahead about our position using code words. They refer to us as ants. And so we go marching in, single file, on the same path Ukrainian soldiers take. Past the craters, the Russian line is only a mile and a half away. We've just heard an explosion nearby, so we're just taking a little cover. Right now we're trying to walk along the tree line so that we're not too visible, we're trying to get to these Ukrainian trenches down the road here. Over, Den. How are you? Trees may conceal, but don't protect from the incoming. The trench is the safest defense. Ukraine's front line is 700 miles long. This trench, just one small section, a thousand feet, eight feet high, and where this unit has deployed for three and a half months. Ihor is the platoon commander. He joined the military in 2014 after the initial Russian invasion. He was recalled a year ago this week. They're trying to attack our direction and to push through our defenses, and we're not letting them do that. We're holding our position. We're doing everything possible to not let this happen. And have they launched frontal assaults against these trenches? With small groups, three to four tanks and infantry. They're attacking with artillery, as you can hear. Their artillery is working. That's how they do it. Ukraine's infantry is tasked with the always vital, sometimes terrifying mission of holding the line. Not all of them have made it. We've had wounded. We've had killed. It's a difficult subject. I don't want to talk about it. Translate that. You don't want to talk about it. It's difficult to talk about. I don't want to talk about it. Any other questions? Ihor lives where he fights. He tries his best to keep out the cold. Everyone here seizes a quiet moment when they can. He has faith that Ukraine can win, but he predicts it will take years. The world should know that while we're fighting the enemy here, the world is safe. And the whole world should help us with everything they can and provide us with weapons to ensure this doesn't happen in their countries. We're capable of stopping the enemy here. Just give us the weapons. Tanks are this unit's primary weapon. The region is flat. For Kyiv to have any chance to push through Russian lines, it says it will need more modern tanks. But 26-year-old Yehor's T-64 tank was originally built in the 1970s. They are old, and because they are old, they break all the time. You don't have confidence that your tank is going to work tomorrow. For us to advance, we need new weaponry, because these tanks are twice as old as I am. Until new weapons arrive, all this unit can do is use its armor like it uses its trenches to hold the line against a larger Russian force. In order to destroy the enemy and be more effective in our offensive, we need heavy weapons. Without tanks, we're not doing anything right now. It's not easy to destroy a stationary firing position, even a machine gun. And Russia has a web of stationary positions. They still control 20 percent of Ukraine, and they've spent months digging in. Russian trenches, vehicle barriers, and tank traps fill Ukraine south and east. They run all the way up to the northern part of the eastern front, where we visited next. 
Russia controlled this land just a few months ago. So to prevent a Ukrainian counteroffensive, they mined the fields that we drove through. Which directions, the Russians? In front of us. The 103rd Brigade's mortar unit positions itself as close as possible to Russian troops and is deep into a forest. The more isolated, the harder to target. The commander is a 46-year-old whose call sign is Kalina, a berry on Ukraine's coat of arms. The front line here hasn't moved an inch since they arrived nine months ago. Do you have the weapons you need to be able to fight effectively? No, we don't have enough weapons. We don't have a large enough caliber. The largest that we keep is 82 millimeters, and we need at least 120 millimeters. We keep telling our commanders about this, but right now, no one is providing those to us. They've been fighting for one year, but that doesn't mean it feels normal. Their patch is the Lviv Lion, Kalina's hometown in the country's far west. Did you think you'd still be here one year later? No, I've never thought I would spend so much time here. I'm not young, I'm not fit for the army. I thought they would just train me and let me go home. But it all happened in a very different way, and now we're here. They use drones to spot Russian targets, and then... 20 rounds in about three minutes. They adjust the mortar back to the original target and repeat. But they admit they're limited by the quantity and quality of their ammunition. And that means the best this unit can do as well is hold the line against the Russian troops they continue to target. The next day, we headed to the outskirts of Russia's primary goal, Bakhmut. U.S. officials downplay the city's importance and have raised with Ukraine falling back to higher ground to defend larger cities. But Ukraine calls Bakhmut a symbol of resistance and a gateway to the rest of Donetsk province. The city has been largely abandoned or destroyed. And the fighting has been fierce, targeting Russia's paramilitary Wagner Group. The U.S. assesses it has taken 30,000 casualties. Wagner's owner, who is close to Putin, posted this photo this morning, identifying the bodies as those killed just yesterday. The Ukrainian soldiers fighting for Bakhmut have witnessed some of the most brutal battles of the last year. They are sending their soldiers as cannon fodder. We target their equipment and their soldiers, but they keep coming and coming and keep dying and dying and even then keep coming and coming. Alexander leads a 93rd Brigade artillery unit. There are other units with more advanced equipment, but the vast majority are like this one. Their self-propelled artillery is also from the 1970s. The brigade gave us this video from a surveillance drone of what it said was its artillery hitting its target. They and everyone here say Bakhmut is worth it. This place is strategically important, but first and foremost, this is our land. And every inch of our land is of the utmost importance, because people are dying for it. If we give up Bakhmut, we would be giving up so many lives of those who've been defending it for such a long time. Have you lost men? Have you lost friends? Yes. We all lost uh, friends. We all lost... Uh, We've all lost someone in this war and keep losing. That's how it goes. This is war. You can't do anything about it. But these are all losses that cannot be prevented. They just happen because people kill people. That's it. On the front lines, Ukraine knows the price it will continue to have to pay, how many men will continue to lose. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Nick Schifrin, outside Bakhmut, Ukraine.